So um, before I get started, I just want to say uh, thank you to Singapore CSS for this opportunity. Um, also, thank you to our host, the internet. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. So, you know, keep on keeping on internet. You're, you're uh, hero number one in this whole thing. And um, thank you as well to our previous two speakers. Uh, I really enjoyed their uh, presentations and I'm gonna be sharing them around internally in our uh, work Slack. So let's get started. So it's 2020 and responsive design is now mandatory for any project on the web. But sometimes it seems our process gets in the way of what we're actually trying to do. We seem to be obsessed with checking off boxes. Is there an iPad view? Can you use it in a screen reader? What's the time to first paint? These are all means to an end, but we need to keep the big picture in mind, building experiences that work anywhere and for anyone. Inclusive design teaches us that it's more than just these checkboxes. Where's the test for holding a screaming baby in a bag of groceries while trying to message your family? Where's the test for looking at a map on your smartphone in the noonday sun? Um, CSS is often overlooked as something to take advantage of when it comes to doing accessibility work, but it has a lot of potential when viewed through the lens of inclusive design. And assumptions are the antithesis of inclusive design, so let's begin with some level setting. What is the web? It's many things to many people, but at its core, it's about content. And that might sound kind of glib, so to put it another way, it's about communicating and acting on information. So again, you know, what is the web? Structurally, this is the ideal, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, a nice and tidy separation of concerns. However, it is the web, so of course it's gonna be a little weird. Lately, it's begun to feel more like these concerns are starting to blur, and that's not necessarily a value judgment, it just is the way things are. But it does feel like because of these choices, we're leaving some people out in the cold. So let's set a common understanding to talk about this a little bit more. HTML describes meaning. Uh, it describes meaning semantically. It's an ordered hierarchy of content and not an arbitrary stack of divs. I would say this isn't an idealized situation, but unfortunately that's usually not true in the real world. JavaScript adds behavior. Uh, it does not create structure. And this might seem like an oversimplification and hey, you're right. This is a CSS talk. CSS creates priority. Remember, at its core, the web is about content and appearance is just the visual priority of content. So played to their strengths, these three technologies working together make the web accessible. Uh, that's one of the founding principles of the web and honoring it makes compliance easier. So what is compliance? I've always thought it's weird that human-centered design is a specialty in our field. We build interfaces for people, so of course you want people to be able to use these interfaces. At its core, audits are really, and compliance, are really just a formalized set of checks that guarantee everyone can operate an interface regardless of their device, ability, or circumstances. But, you know, that's baseline. It can be so much more than that. So, what is web compliance? Well, responsive design is adapting to an unknown browser. You don't make an assumption about where it will be accessed. And inclusive design is adapting to an unknown user. You don't make an assumption about who will use it. So played to their strengths, these two methodologies working together cast the widest possible net to include people. And that's really important because as more and more services necessary to living everyday life go online, it is vital to make sure everyone can use them. So what is a browser? If your entry point is a desktop, chances are it'll be either Edge or Safari. But then there's also the other popular browsers and their mobile counterparts. Mobile is already a very common entry point for the web, and sometimes it's the only option if you're economically disadvantaged. Then there's the newcomers and the slightly less popular yet still totally legitimate browsers and their developer editions. Don't forget that the industry tends to be Western centric, but that's rapidly changing. Remember, it's the world wide web, not the wealthy Western web. 
So the point is browsers are impossible to corral and it might seem intimidating, but it's actually a good thing. Different users have different needs and we don't wanna be prescriptive because we can't know all of our users needs all the time or how they go about satisfying them. And inclusive design embraces this. So again, what is a browser? It's a slide that is failing to load, cool. Let me see if I, ah, okay. Well, uh, browsers are ubiquitous, but we still don't really think of them that way. Um, when seeing the word browser, people typically think Google Chrome on a desktop. This should be a slide of Google Chrome. I imagine you can imagine it. And the way we interact with browsers changes constantly. Uh, this is Lynx, an early text-based browser. Browsers can also use a lot of different interaction modes. Here, a browser extension can generate a hierarchical list of all the headings on a page the same way a screen reader can. And browsers might be on platforms you may not immediately be thinking of. Uh, the Sony PlayStation ships with one built in. We tend to make assumptions about nearly every aspect of our audience. Uh, here's a leap pad. It's a tablet with a browser that's sold to kids. And we also make assumptions based on price. Here's a $30 touchscreen smartphone with a color display and a camera. And here's a Kindle, a luxury device with a slow monochromatic display. We also assume that devices will come through traditional channels and be used as intended. Here's a chip, a full color touch display computer with a non-standard screen size that can get a browser hacked onto it in minutes. And here's an oscilloscope that runs Internet Explorer. We also tend to assume a lot about form factor. Uh, it's a fridge that runs Android, and yes, it's real. You can go and buy it right now. It's effectively an immobile, low-power browser with a long product lifespan. And we don't really know what the future will be like. The web itself was a surprise. Think about how much it's changed in only 20 years. Do you know where it'll be in the next 20? Your car's windshield, your contact lenses, your bathroom mirror. I guarantee you that whatever the future holds, there's going to be some sort of browser in it. Uh, the web isn't going away anytime soon. So by making things as robust as possible in the present, you're making them adaptable, which is a great way for weathering the seas of change. This is embracing inclusive design in the short term to do the heavy list lifting for us in the long term. So how does CSS fit in all this? After all, this is a talk about media queries. Well, that depends on how you talk about it. Um, so writing the correct CSS once is pretty easy. Making that CSS work in all situations and for all people is the hard part. That's a quote from Mika Godbolt, senior design developer at Microsoft. For me, working in all situations and for all people falls into the domain of media queries. So how do I talk about media queries? Media queries describe meaning in context. So close your eyes for a second and imagine you're in a dark room with some friends and there's an elephant in the room, uh, literally, not figuratively. Reach out and touch it and describe what you're experiencing. Uh, the tusks feel like spears, the trunk feels like a snake, the tail feels like a rope, the legs feel like wooden stumps. That's kind of how I think about media queries in that you have this ideal of a idea of a coded site floating out there with different browsers describing what it is from their perspective and capability. And uh, you can open your eyes now if you haven't already. As a consultant, I see a few repeated patterns when working with other people's CSS. That usually boils down to copying and pasting without knowing all the potential of the technology. Another tell are libraries that make writing media queries easier, but at the expense of leaving other features out. That's not necessarily a value judgment. People have deadlines and hey, if it works, it works. Hopefully, however, I can give you a few more tricks to share with your team. So the absence of support for media queries is in fact the first media query. Uh, that's a quote from Brian Rieger's landmark Rethinking the Web, Rethinking the Mobile Web Talk. So what you want here are sensible defaults to accommodate the unknown. So larger type and a comfortable line height and width to accommodate concerns such as farsightedness and dyslexia. Good affordances for interactive areas for motor control issues such as Parkinson's or arthritis. Uh, 
and a clear hierarchy of content and chunking of information for cognitive concerns, such as reading level. Cognitive disabilities are worth discussing a little bit in detail here. Uh, we tend to think of disabilities as people in wheelchairs, but the vast majority of disability issues are actually cognitive. This is on authority from the World Health Organization and their reports outline depression as one of the most significant forms of cognitive impairment. This isn't assumptions about English as a second language or lack of public schooling. This is a widespread genetic and environmental issue that affects the entire planet. Depression can stunt things like problem solving and the learning and application of knowledge, but we barely ever discuss it because of the social stigmas. One way we can help to combat placing the cognitive burden on the end user is to make things easier and more obvious to use. And media queries, as it turns out, help you exactly do just that. So how do we make one? When any device's viewport reaches a minimum of width of 30 M's, do the following. This is what we want to do. So how do we get there? Here's the syntax. When the media rule keyword of at media is present and the min width of 30 M's media feature occurs, apply these selectors and declarations. So why M's? They accommodate the widest swath of browsers. Most importantly, since they are based on type size, they elegantly and dynamically accommodate browser zoom. Um, that's helpful for people with low vision. A lot of exhaustive research has been done on this, and to be honest, your pixel value use case isn't as clever as you think it is, and REMs fall apart in some really obscure edge cases. So just, just trust me here for a moment, just, just use EMS. So now let's up the complexity a little. When a device with a screen's viewport reaches a minimum width of 30 EMS, do the following. So how do we get here? With a media type of screen and a minimum width of 30 M's, apply these selectors and declarations. The media type is a subtle but important distinction. It targets screens. So what other media types are there? See, here's all the media types listed in the documentation on the W3C. There's all, which targets all media type devices, Aural, which targets speech and sound synthesizers. Braille, which targets Braille tactic, tactile feedback devices. Embossed, which targets paged Braille printers. Handheld, which targets small or handheld devices. Print, which targets printers. Projection, which tar targets projected presentations. Screen, which targets computer screens. Speech, which targets speech synthesizers. TTY, which targets uh, teltypes and terminals. And TV, which targets television type devices. You know, so that's really cool, but again, it's the web, so things aren't gonna be easy and straightforward. Only all print, screen, and speech have wide enough support to be used with confidence. Of those four, speech is tricky because of the lack of any real support for RL CSS properties. Um, yes, they exist, and yes, it would be awesome if we could use them. Uh, RL CSS is intended to tell a digitized voice how it should read content the same way regular CSS tells the browser how to visually display content. Uh, that's good for screen readers, but don't forget that digital assistants are becoming very popular. Print is often overlooked, but more people print web pages than you'd think. CSS media features like before and after pseudo elements let us create meaningful artifacts like printed URLs for links and descriptions of the main takeaway for interactive visualizations. I've even seen QR codes uh, on print style sheets for long, difficult to type URLs that pre-configure user-facing state, which goes to show a little consideration can go a long way user experience-wise. Another interesting thing I'd like to point out here, handheld, projection, and TV have all been deprecated because what is a TV? You know, what is a projector? Good inclusive design principles obviates the need for these kinds of distinctions. If your color contrast ratio and type size are good, you don't have to worry about targeting a projector. Print is often overlooked, but more people print web pages than you'd think. Oh, that is a repeat. And where am I? Hello. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Another thing I'd like to point out is the all media type. A lot of browsers will default to using this if you don't explicitly state a media type, and this can get you into trouble via the unintended consequences of the cascade. It's better to get in the habit of declaring screen when you make visual edits. So 
Cool. Let's talk media features now. Uh, the background from this slide is one of my favorite scenes from a movie. Uh, the Blues Brothers asked the bartender of a backwater bar what kind of music they usually play. And she answers, oh, we got both kinds. We got country and Western. And that's kind of how I feel about media features. Most developers only use width and height, but we have eight other media features available to work with. So there's height and width, but there's also aspect ratio, which determines the ratio between a, the viewport's height and width. Uh, there's color, which uh, determines the device's presence of color in the device. Uh, there's color index, which is the number of entries in the color lookup table. Grid is if the device is a grid device, such as a TTY terminal. Monochrome uh, is if the device does not have color and uses shades of a single color in place. Uh, orientation is if the device is in landscape or portrait mode. Resolution is if uh, it targets the display density of the device. And scan uh, is the type of scanning process the display uses to refresh. These are important. Um, they allow us to really dig into the capabilities of a device, the quality of its screen, its physical orientation in space, how it handles color. However, a lot of time in these lists, you will also see these three deprecated features, device aspect ratio, device height, device width. Simply put, don't use them. Remember, it's near impossible to know what a device is, but we can react to how a device behaves. Like programming languages, media queries also have logic. It's pretty basic, but also pretty powerful in the right hands. The at media declaration itself is an if statement. If the browser supports at media, do something. You can chain with and, target screens with both a minimum height of 20 M's and a minimum width of 30 M's, or allows you to apply this or that, target anything with a max width of 10 M's or a minimum width of 20 M's, but nothing in between. And you can exclude with not. So target anything with a max width display of 10, 10 M's that isn't monochrome. So why is all of this so great? With good namespacing discipline, you can adapt your content to best fit the device it will be consumed on without specifically knowing what that device is. So you wanna use media queries to write small surgical tweaks that enhance the class and not the page the class is placed on. So here, the theme background class can safely remove images for devices that would break if they try to display them and remove backgrounds from media that would choke on rendering them. Um, people still use grid displays and still print web pages, and not for the reasons you'd initially think. For example, I've got a terminal powered by WebKit open on my computer right now, and a stack of uh, printed slide notes in case things go really bad. Uh, so armed with these expanded capabilities, how do we go about best using them? First, you want to set your breakpoints based on ergonomics and not devices. Think about how we position ourselves around our devices and that you may not always have the luxury of being the one doing the positioning. Uh, your distance from the device is a good baseline for setting type size. Ask yourself, is the type sufficiently large enough to read when you hold the device in your palm or on your lap, when you're sitting at a desk or when you're across the room? In fact, take a moment to think about how you're viewing this presentation right now. Good typography is the cornerstone of any interface. Once you have it established, you can build outwards with confidence. With regard to media queries, a very smart guy called Brad Frost uh, advises us to not go overboard, to treat layout as an enhancement, and to let content determine breakpoints. Um, remember to think not in terms of audience, but in terms of people. People aren't always going to be on a WebKit browser or a Windows machine but they will be reading the web. Don't target common device screen sizes, even if your analytics guy wants you to. You have people that use iPads, not iPad users. And that's a subtle yet important distinction. I'd also like to point out another at rule supports. Uh, I believe it was mentioned briefly in uh, John's talk. Although it is not technically a media query, it is very much in keeping with the spirit of this presentation. Supports allows us to construct what is known as a feature query, which lets you adjust the interface based on what level of compliance the browser has for modern CSS features. That ensures that everyone gets a high quality experience regardless of their device. 
In this example, the site's text would get a high contrast fallback that would have otherwise been illegible when rendered by a browser that does not support background blend modes. Those gradient loaded full page hero screens that seem to be so in vogue these days. All right, cool. Now let's get on to the obscure stuff. A high contrast mode is a setting that makes interfaces legible for, pure, for people experiencing extreme low vision. Uh, on this example, the logo on the Boston Globe is not visually apparent when high contrast mode is enabled. This is bad because logos that link home are a common affordance people use to navigate. And remember that high contrast doesn't always mean a low vision disorder is present either. Uh, pro tip, max brightness and high contrast mode enabled allows you to use your laptop in the garden. Looks ugly, but functional. You know, you get ugly, but functional tattoo. That's, that's a great phrase. So this is a tweet by uh, somebody called Sean Glass, and he's not a specialist or an industry rock star. Um, he's just some guy on Twitter uh, who is environmentally disabled by a bright sunshine who's making the technology work for him and not the other way around. The high contrast mode meter query only works in Internet Explorer and Edge on Windows 7, 8, and 10 for now. In the example, we're telling the SVG icon in a button to match the color of the button label, whatever the label color might be set to. And I'm saying set to because Windows high contrast colors are mapped to CSS system color keywords. This is important because Windows allows you to create custom high, cost themes, high contrast themes with your own colors. So the colors that you set could hypothetically be anything. And here's a mapping of the content types and the relevant keywords that will allow you to work with high contrast mode. Uh, text maps to window text, links map to the uh, anchor element. Selected text is highlight text and highlight, which is the foreground and background of the, the highlight, respectively. Uh, button label uh, maps to button face and background maps to window. Again, you want to use these values in place of static color declarations, but only if your content doesn't show up. And the best way to avoid your content not showing up in high contrast mode is to use semantic HTML. Uh, P elements for paragraphs, heading elements for headings, button elements for buttons. You get the idea. Reduced motion. What's that? Well, it's exactly what it says it is. Reduced motion allows you to target users who have explicitly stated a preference for less motion in the UI animation. This is great for people with vestibular disorders, ADHD, and migraines, or for people like me who are impatient curmudgeons who have no time for watching gratuitous UI animation over and over and over again. This media, work, media query works in current versions of Edge, Firefox, Safari, Opera, and Chrome, but only when reduced motion is enabled in the operating system preferences. In this example, we're removing uh, animation from a large background, uh, but we could also slow it down or simplify things if the use case requires the animation in order to convey critical information. Again, it prefers reduced motion, not prefers no motion. Like high contrast mode, these tweaks are there for those who need them to make the experience work for everyone regardless of their circumstances. Not a lot of people are aware of these two features, but that doesn't mean we should ignore using them because of it. You might be in a situation where you're not seeing the personal benefit, or you are, but your boss might not see the business case. And here it's important to remember that disabilities are more than just screen reader support. They're a spectrum of concerns, and inclusive design teaches us that disabilities can be conditional. Harsh glare, a fever, a broken arm, depression, not knowing the native language, or just simply getting older. Unfortunately, we also live in an age where people can and will use disability triggers as attack vectors, such as deliberately sending a journalist with epilepsy seizure-inducing tweets. So, Advocate for your future self, and in doing so, advocate and make the web better for others. All right, uh, let's talk about the future now. The writing is on the wall, and by wall, I mean the specs. It's feature queries. Feature queries are media queries for user preferences. Existing media queries have display really locked down, so now it's all about letting our users tell us what they want and responding to it. We've had a taste of this with the last couple of examples, so let's see what's coming down the pike. 
Interaction covers the new pointer and hover media features, which go together like strawberries and chocolate. These two features can adjust the display based on how we interact with the device. Pointer reacts to the accuracy of the device's primary form of input. Um, so it can be coarse, which is a pointing device with limited accuracy, fine, which is an accurate pointing device such as a mouse, and no pointing device, so there is none, no input whatsoever other that, that makes contact with the screen. It's important to note primary is the operative word here, since there are devices that can accept multiple forms of input. Here's a Microsoft Surface, a device with a touchscreen, a trackpad, a stylus, and a wireless mouse. And you need to keep this sort of thing in mind when you start messing around with things like clickable areas. Remember also that individuals with motor control issues may augment their device tools, and that it's just easier to work with the cascade and create sensible touch target sizes uh, from the start. Hover capability is also determined by the device's primary input mechanism. Um, you have Hover, which is a device that can uh, hover with limited accuracy from the pointing device. Um, you have On Demand, which is kind of what we're used to on the traditional desktop, which is more or less instantaneous hover on mouse over. And then uh, No Hover, which is the accurate pointing device such as your finger making contact with a smartphone screen. As a rule, I don't like interfaces that utilize Hover to expose functionality. Uh, it's a throwback from a desktop and mouse-centric era. And in addition to issues with discoverability, it is also problematic for people with motor control issues, to say nothing about technological literacy concerns. I think it's also worth mentioning here that small devices aren't always lacking in Hover capability, and the opposite also applies. Large devices might not have hover capability as well. iPad Pros, anyone? All right, so now let's talk about media queries that speak to the display itself. Display mode allows us to change things based on how the browser itself is presented. Uh, there's browser, which is what we're used to with tabs and other UI Chrome. Uh, full screen, which is when the browser is full screen, such as this presentation in Google Slides. Um, minimal UI is where the browser will behave like a native app, but still display some parts of its Chrome. And standalone, where it basically operates like a completely uh, native app on your device. So as progressive web apps become more popular, uh, the, these media queries become more important. Uh, the inclusive design angle here is a low bandwidth battle for the home screen one where web apps can behave like native apps while still being open and interoperable. The web is becoming a first-class citizen for mobile operating systems, which is huge because, frankly, the accessibility of Android apps stinks. And HTML as a format is far more accommodating to assistive technology. Update checks how quickly the device is able to modify the appearance of the content. Um, slow is if it display updates infrequently, such as a Kindle. Update um, updates frequently, such as uh, a computer monitor. And no, none is no update frequency info transmitted. This can be for a e-ink display uh, or something similar. And this one's pretty straightforward. You're able to more granularly craft experiences for e-ink or lower power devices, such as removing animated GIFs uh, for devices that may struggle to render them in real time. So a gentleman by the name of Andres Gallant wrote a great article for CS Tricks uh, about putting them all together. Um, he says mobile, small, portrait, slow, interlace, monochrome, coarse, non-hover first. By which I mean mobile first was a great starting point for when we first were figuring out what responsive design was. But in our everything has a browser now, world, this update uh, provides a rock solid future friendly foundation on how to think about building interactive experiences. The prefers color scheme media feature allows you to style your content based on the color theme the user has chosen. Most of you know this as styling for dark mode, and there are a ton of really good articles that have already been written about the topic. Uh, so I'm not going to spend much time on it on this presentation. <clears throat> 
I would, however, like to call attention to a certain someone's dark mode um, implementation as it's one of the coolest looking ones I've seen out there. Uh, light level uses the device's sensors to determine how bright the environment is. This media query makes me feel old because we now assume that the majority of devices will ship with some sort of camera built into them. Uh, some of you may remember Mandy's earlier Singapore CSS talk where she demonstrated the ambient light API. Uh, that JavaScript and this CSS media query are two sides of the same technology coin, which is really cool. There are three options for light level, normal, dim, and washed. This is also cool because washed has been discussed as a supplement for high contrast mode in that you want things to stand out more when there's a ton of glare being applied to your screen. Let's also note that normal lighting is rated to what the manufacturer of the device describes as ideal for the screen. But since these technologies are open and interoperable, there is also the potential to override them as a user, uh, say with a system-wide preference toggle or a uh, custom browser extension. Scripting allows us to target JavaScript or the lack thereof. You know, if, if JS can reach into CSS, I feel it's fair that the opposite can also kind of happen here. Um, there are three values, uh, enabled, none, and initialed. Um, enabled is if the user can support JavaScript, while none is if it is disabled or it fails to load. Remember, even though we live in the age of monolithic JavaScript frameworks, every user technically does not have JavaScript until they do when it loads. And this might get me some subtweets from guys with fancy Twitter bios, but the larger the J JavaScript payload, the larger the chance of failure. Um, and if you're thinking this smells a lot like arguing for progressive enhancement, you're absolutely right. Environment blending lets us target the characteristics of someone's display. This means we can adjust our content if the device is opaque, like a traditional monitor. Um, additive means display color blends with the colors of the real world, such as a car's heads up display. Whereas subtractive means the opposite. An example of this would be an LCD embedded in a mirror. Inverted colors are the poor man's high contrast mode. Most operating systems can do it. I use it when an app on my iPhone doesn't have support for dark mode. And you know, again, you can chain uh, this media feature using the media query logic described earlier. And it's worth mentioning that Chrome actually has a extension for inverted colors, which is a good reminder that you shouldn't be in the business of trying to do device sniffing, especially when it comes to assistive technology. A practical application of inverted colors would be this double inversion technique where you invert inverted multimedia. Simple and powerful and ensures the content remains legible and nice looking regardless of what mode it is currently being viewed in. And um, you know, remember high contrast mode from earlier? Well, guess what? Uh, the forced colors media feature is the updated version of it. Forced colors will be a standard that all browsers can implement which is great because it grants people more choices for what browser they can use, uh, especially browsers that play well, well with assistive technologies such as Safari and Firefox. And finally, um, prefers reduced data lets you target when someone has set their device to a mode where it uses less of their data plan. This is useful for all sorts of scenarios, um, especially ones where, if, where a phone may be someone's sole source of access to the internet. A great example of how you may be able to use this media feature could be loading decorative assets only when a user has the bandwidth for it. Uh, background images are a great example of this, um, as well as fonts. Uh, preferred reduced transparency is a lot like preferred reduced motion. Uh, instead of removing animation, we get the ability to target the presence of semi-transparent operating system Chrome. All major operating systems have this ability to disable their semi-transparency effect, and all major operating systems have had accessibility issues with this visual treatment. Uh, of note is iOS 7 when it first rolled out. With preferred re prefers reduced transparency, you can make sure that someone who is struggling to determine what is the foreground and background can actually read and take action on your content, which honestly makes me question why you didn't design it that way in the first place. 
Many of these, so you know, many of these features can be tricky to discover if you don't spend all day working with technology. Remember when Brian Rieger said that the absence of a media query is the first media query to consider? Well, I'd like you to think about how accessible something is without any special features turned on. Um, start with good accessible defaults tested by the people who will be using your site or app and only make media query tweaks when you need to because you can't always know if someone will have these features enabled or are even aware they exist. And so we don't end on a low note here. I'd also like to say that media queries have have a lot of potential and by reacting to user needs, they are only going to get better, not only for developers, but also for the people who will be using what they make. There's gonna be a ton of wonderful things written by brilliant people that we'll be seeing in the coming months and years. And I, for one, can't wait to use them. So um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, uh, Singapore CSS, and to you, the audience, for your time and attention. I know we covered a lot of material, um, so, if you want to reach me, here's a slide that's not loading. I'm ericwbailey.design uh, is my personal website, and I'm at ericwbailey. Posting the slides with links to resources I used to develop this talk. And if we have time for questions, I'd love to answer any of them. And uh, thank you again.